All right, we are live with Mr. Dan Buglio. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you, Zaid. You can call me Dan. You don't have to call me sir. All I may right. be a little bit older than you, but you don't have to call me Dan. Right, I, call call me I call everybody sir, but noted. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, this is casual. Yeah. So thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Um, this is probably going to be the first of many episodes talking about health and you know chronic pain relief and what young men and women can do to take control of their health. And so for people who don't know who you are and what you do, could you give us you know, a quick preview of who Dan is? Who Dan is, all right. So um, I'm a regular guy, I'm not a doctor, medical professional, no fancy degrees, no white lab coats. I'm just a regular guy who dealt with 13 years of back pain and sciatica. Uh, Dr. Sarno, I don't know if you're familiar with that name. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sarno is the original guy who first made this mind body concept extremely popular with several books on the topic um, and helping out famous people like Howard Stern and John Stossel and some some pretty heavy duty people in the in the media early on. So I learned about this mind body concept, but uh, just reading his books and trying to figure it out on my own, it took me another 12 years to end my back pain. I made every mistake possible and uh, finally was able to somehow accidentally stumble on the right combination of mindset, thinking, attention on the symptoms and moving forward with life. And in hindsight, it's a lot of what I currently teach today, um, but I had no idea what I was doing. So that's why it took me so long. So for anybody listening, it's not going to take you 13 years. Zaid and I are going to give you the cheat sheet right yeah. here as to how to fast track recovery. Uh, and I've been paying attention to this stuff since the early 90s. So long time. Got uh, it. And so how, go ahead. What were you gonna say? No, I was going to ask how, um, how things started for you with the, with the back pain and the sciatica. Is it um, it's come out of the blue or, you know, started just one day bending over while getting dressed, putting on my underwear, actually pretty embarrassing story, literally bending over to put on my underwear and all of a sudden right in the back, oh, major back spasm. And that started 13 years of pain. Sometimes it was mild. Sometimes it was pretty wild. Um, lots of efforts in the medical world. The first year, uh, chiropractic muscle relaxers, rest, stretching, physical therapy. None of that stuff was providing me a benefit. Found Dr. Sarno's work, read his book, and reasonably quick, within a month or two, I was feeling better. But then a few months later, whammo, would come back. And that was the cycle on and off for a while. And then after a while, it just became pretty steady and chronic. Um, and I tried all the mind-body techniques uh, there were people talking about med meditation or journaling and Sarno was talking about, you know, talk to your brain, think psychologically, reject the physical. And, you know, I, I knew all the catchphrases, but I didn't really know how to implement it. I was still hyper-focused on the pain. I was still talking about it all the time. I was the guy in the neighborhood with the back pain. Hey, Dan, how's your back? Oh, it's tough today. And, you know, just a heavy focus on it, a lot of fear around it. You wake up going, how bad's today gonna be? And of course our brain goes, let me show you. Yeah, exactly. And so a lot of years of making mistakes, finally got it dialed in and I couldn't have even told you at that time what I did to get rid of it. It just kind of came together. Um, that's very interesting because that's a, that's a question that I get a lot is people say, well, like when was the moment? What was the day where you where you you figured it out and you you knew you were done? Like what did you do right before then? And I had the same answer. I was like, I don't know. I just woke I'm not up sure. one day and, <laughs> yeah. and I was In my impression, you know, it's like an overall lowering lowering of the fear and the attention that we give the symptoms. And at a certain point in time, the brain goes, he must be okay. He's not freaking out about it. He's not focused on it. He's not thinking about it all day, every day. He's just kind of getting on with doing normal things. And when the brain sees you doing normal things, it goes, oh, I guess he's okay. Right. And 
that seems a little bit weird when you don't understand the context but do you mind if i get into my theory on what's creating symptoms in the first place absolutely that's what we're here for all right so dr sarno's theory was it was all about repressed negative emotions and his theory was that the brain is trying to distract us from the repressed negative emotions because the brain perceives those emotions as dangerous. When those emotions start bubbling up close to the surface, the brain goes, oh, that's, that's dangerous stuff. We have to distract Dan from those emotions. And he, he may very well be right that the brain perceives negative emotions that are ready to boil over as dangerous because of social consequences, because of our beliefs that emotions are bad, it make me a bad person, I'm out of control, I'm crazy, all the things we may have learned growing up about emotions like, hey, kids are made to be seen, not heard, I'll give you something to cry about, you know, and all this negative programming about emotions, that emotions are not allowed, they're not cool right men are taught to be stoic don't ever let them see a cry uh even women taught the same thing be strong don't let them see a cry whatever that may be so sarno was probably right that the brain perceived emotions as dangerous but it's not just emotions all sorts of things work stress family stress life stress relationship stress money stress right and then once you start having pain the reason it started may have nothing to do with why I was in pain for 13 years total. Because the brain perceiving danger, like in Sarno's example, the brain perceived the emotions as dangerous. Pain is the result. It's a, it's a warning signal. It's there to protect us from something the brain perceives as dangerous. So once we have pain, we get medicalized. We get traumatized by the medical system that fails to fix us. We get tests, we get MRIs, we get imaging studies, we get diagnoses. And in your world, you've got, you know, lab cultures and bacterial tests and everything else. And then pelvic floor dysfunction and all these medical labels. And, you know, before you know it, you're traumatized by the medical system that goes, Zate, you're broken. You're messed up. You have to do all these weird things to fix yourself. And then when it doesn't work, you go, holy cow. There's no answer. I'm stuck. There's no answer. What does that do? It creates more danger, more fear. And before you know it, you're pretty much walking around feeling broken, that there's no answer. And um, there's a lot of fear generated by that, a lot of despair. This is going to be my life. Now, you look like a fairly young guy, so you were probably going through this at a pretty early age. And so you're sitting there thinking, is this really the rest of my life? Because I've been to every doctor I can find. And they don't have an answer for me. So we become traumatized by the medical system. We become of the belief that we're broken, which does nothing but keep the brain on high alert, always looking out for danger, always perceiving danger. So I, I coined the term perceived danger pain. It also applies to perceived danger symptoms because it's not just pain we're dealing with. It could be vertigo, reflux, uh, muscle tension, any number of things, right? So perceived danger is the cause of the symptoms. It's a warning signal. Right. Almost always chronic symptoms are a mistake by the brain. Fear and attention gets this warning signal stuck, turned on, right? So even if you had a real injury, enough fear and attention, you can make that pain last long after the injury healed. So I don't know how that applies, a real infection in the uh, the world of pelvic urinary issues. Enough fear and attention. Well, number one, the stress can reduce the immune system, which can allow more frequent infections. But number two, the fear can allow the brain to remember the sensations. And so it may feel like you've got an infection, but it tests clean you're okay. And so fear and attention are what makes things chronic. And in my experience, chronic pain, chronic symptoms are almost always the brain overprotective, keeping the symptoms on in an attempt to keep us safe from doing something that the brain thinks might be dangerous. So perceives mm -hmm. that danger is the problem. And to me, the straightest line to recovery is what's the opposite of danger? Safety. Safety. 
we got to teach the brain, the scared, overprotective, misinformed subconscious of ours that um, we're really not in danger. I'm fine down there. I was fine with my back. And here I am, 58. My chronic pain started in my early 30s, and I feel better now than I did in my 30s. So it had nothing to do with age, right? That's incredible. So and if and, I can comment real quick on yeah, of course. the thing you said with stress, um, there's now plenty of research showing high levels of stress. Uh, stress has all kinds of impacts, negative impacts on our gut health, mm -hmm. which we already know talks to the brain. Plus so digestion too. Yeah. And which, the immune system, which everybody's system. trying to fix their gut biome with supplements and probiotics and prebiotics and everything else. But they're not doing anything about the core problem, which is too much stress, too much fight or flight, a yeah. suppressed digestion, suppressed immune system. So I always like to go up to the top level. What's the original cause? Because I don't care how much stretching, chiropractic, physical therapy I did. I was trying to fix my body, but that wasn't the cause. My brain perceived I had a bad back. So every time I'd bend over, my brain would go, make it hurt to protect him so he doesn't bend over and hurt himself again. It's a warning signal. It, and so the thing that I like to say is pain is not a reliable indicator of the condition of the body. It's just not. It is a very reliable indicator of the brain perceiving danger. And the more danger the brain is perceiving, in other words, the more freaked out we are consciously and even subconsciously, yeah. the more intense the symptoms are. Yeah. So if you get a big pain flare and you look around and go, what the heck happened? I don't even know why. Inevitably, the brain's perceiving more danger and is elevating the volume of that alarm system. What really stuck out to me from what you said that I don't think I've heard anybody say about this is you said that if at some point you had an infection, your brain will remember the symptoms and sensations of that infection so that even after you heal the infection, your brain will still give you those sensations. Potentially, yeah, for sure. Just I get those I questions that. a lot where people take the antibiotics. Why does, it still, feel, why does yeah. it still feel like I got an infection? Yeah. Due to fear, attention, and a belief that, well, maybe it didn't get the infection out. And then you go back for another test. Nope, it's clear. Then you go back for another test. It's clear. So clear. why do I still have these sensations? It still feels like I got an infection. And every yeah. negative test results leads to more anxiety because you're like, oh my God, there's something in there they're not finding or there's no solution to this. And just like you said, it's, yeah. you know, the medical system is not very comforting and does not necessarily acknowledge the role of stress and the importance of, of stress in this. Yeah. So if I didn't know anything about this and I'm hearing you, I'm going to think, okay, so what you're saying is that there's like the mind is playing tricks on us and you know, this is sort of in my head, right? Like it's right. just psychosomatic pain. So that's a derogatory term that people often take deep offense when they hear it. That's why I don't say in my videos or my coaching, oh, it's all in your head. Because that's dismissive. That's going, you're crazy. Yeah. Nobody's crazy. The symptoms are real. The pain is real. It's just not created by a problem in the body. Look, the brain's job primarily is to keep us safe and alive. You said, the brain's messing with me. No, it's not. It's trying to keep you safe and keep you alive. And the brain, that's just the brain's primary focus. So if the subconscious brain is going, I think we got a problem, it has to warn you. Symptoms are the result. And that applies to real issues and psychosomatic, which is also a term that's interpreted poorly, but it's accurate. Yeah. But... If the brain is perceiving there to be a problem, it will turn on symptoms. Um, that applies to real injury. That applies to real infections. The brain's going, oh, there's something going on down there. It senses these different sensations that aren't like normal urination or normal you know, bodily functions. So it says something's different, and it turns on the alarm system, burning, itchiness, whatever it may be. Normally, 
antibiotics takes care of it okay those sensations go away and the brain goes oh good we're done but depending upon that person's vigilance alert level health anxiety to begin with they might have people in their lives that you know have taught them that we're the sick family we always get sick you know there's always a problem with us it's genetic we you know i have this you watch a parent with you know chronic illness throughout your throughout your life maybe even watch a parent die and holy cow it's very easy to see why people get very health anxious and the medical system doesn't do a lot to dissuade that because mm -hmm. they're the ones walking around giving us label 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 you've got this 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 and then you go to wikipedia and webmd and the internet and and you're like, I have more stuff than I have. I slide up like, holy cow. So people who have what I have got this, this, and that also, I hope I don't get it. And then a week later, they have it. That's because funny because I got all of my symptoms right after reading about the long list of symptoms that come with the symptoms I've never had before, like a couple of years ago. And I what read it online, mean? had them a week later. That's evidence that fear in the brain's perception that something dangerous is happening is what creates symptoms so for anybody watching this if your symptoms got worse the more medical labels and diagnoses you got and the more you read about it and oh by the way you know hopefully you didn't go into any of those chronic support chronic pain support groups or pelvic pain or this and that prostatitis support groups that are full of terrified people who are going to share with you very eagerly the worst case scenario that could possibly ever happen with you and no offense to these groups or the people in them but they don't know what you and i know they don't believe there's a cure they believe they're broken they believe that there's no cure and they're going to tell everybody who shows up for support that they're in for a rough ride yep and get get ready for it and uh i call those bad neighborhoods and again no offense to the people in them. They're just yeah. misled by other people who are terrified. And so I always kind of in a funny way say, never take advice from somebody who is terrified. If their state of being is ah, probably not the person you want to take medical advice from. Right. You know, and again, no offense if you're one of those people who's freaked out right now. The good news is we know what causes symptoms. We know there's a solution. It's a process for figuring out if it applies to you. And we can actually show you how to do it. That's what Zane's, you know, doing this whole podcast for and this YouTube channel is to try to say, this is what I learned. There's a way out. Calm Absolutely. down. Folks. I got your back. So that's beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you for, for explaining all of that. It, it really touches on a lot of, the, the pain points and the fears that mm -hmm. um, I think anybody with chronic pain deals with. And so, you know, one of the things that I discovered on my journey, and I'd love your opinion on this, is I learned that I had some real structural issues in my posture. So mm -hmm. I looked at an x-ray in my back. I was missing, you know, a joint around L5, so there was less stability in my spine. I had this rib flare on my left, so my ribs were rotated out, and my left leg was significantly weaker than my right, and my, my whole left side was jacked up. And so to me, I was like, okay, this is a real structural problem with my posture, and here's the way to fix it with, you know, myofascial release to work on the tight muscles, strengthening the weaker ones, and start having more functional posture. And, you know, the same was true with gut health. You know, I was having a lot of signs of gut inflammation. So I cleaned up my diet, started supplementing and sort of trying to attack it from all the holistic approaches. So what in your experience and what you've seen, what you've experienced with your clients, what is your perspective on trying those other modalities along with stress reduction? Do they help? Are they completely irrelevant in your opinion? How does that work? So within my space, most of the people that I deal with are aware of Dr. Sarno, this concept called TMS, which he termed tension myositis syndrome, later evolved to the mind-body syndrome. Um, so a lot of people in my space are in that realm, but they still get caught up in trying to fix the body. 
Um, I don't believe posture causes pain. I just don't. Why? Because I sit in this chair, I'm computer all the time. I'm looking at my phone all the time. I've even got the forward head tilt, you know. Yeah. My posture's not good. I slouch in chairs all the time. I don't have a good posture, but I, I haven't had pain for 14 years. Nothing chronic. So I don't yeah. believe posture is as big of a problem as all of these posture guys want to make it out to be because they want to sell you a posture program to now look, there's nothing wrong with posture. You're going to look better if you got a good posture, right? Nothing wrong with it. But I just don't believe fixing your posture is the cure because I don't think fixing your posture or I don't think your bad posture is the problem. Um, one leg weaker than the other. I don't believe that is necessarily the cause of all of the wild type of extreme symptoms we've had either. The belief that you got a messed up body is much more potent than the actual difference in strength. Um, for anybody who's curious, if you go to painfreeyou.com, it's my website, scroll about halfway down, you'll see a photograph of me standing in front of, you know, my wife taking a picture. My hips were out of alignment. It caused my spine to go up this way and then tilt back this way. So now my shoulders were out this way. My head was tilt. I was all jacked up. I mean, it was literally like all out of whack. But I wasn't in pain because I was crooked. I was crooked because I had been in pain for so long. The crooked was the result of years or over a decade of pain. Now, what's cool is once I was able to resolve the pain through the mind-body concepts I teach, um, in Sarno's method, I'll give him credit, I didn't have to do a thing with my body. When the pain went away, the muscle spasm stopped, and I realigned automatically. Over time, wasn't immediate, but just imagine, you know, lower back muscles right above your hips. If this one's constantly in spasm, what is it going to do? Pulls your hips out of alignment, which threw my spine out of alignment. And now I had to tilt back this way to keep from falling over. So, and now all of a sudden my shoulders are this way and my head's out that way. And, but once I let go of the pain, you know, here's once this pain and spasm let up, things evened up and I, and I realigned. Um, and you didn't do any corrective exercises, oh, I exercises tried specific. While I was pain. Never yeah. worked. It was never the cure. I mean, I could do some stretches that would provide me very temporary relief. Yeah. After I get done stretching, it's like, ah, oh, I feel good. I get up, I'm like feeling a little bit straighter. 20 minutes later, whack, I'm out of line. So to me, if you've got muscle imbalances or muscle tension or spasms, working on the muscles is just convincing your brain further, I got a muscle problem. I didn't have a muscle problem. I didn't have a back problem. My brain was perceiving that I was the guy with the bad back. And most of my big flare-ups came when I was bending over to do something, pick something up, lean over a desk, put on underwear, you name it, pick up a laundry basket. Almost always the major flare-ups where it was would floor me for a few days always happened while bending over. So what do you think my brain did every time I'd go to bend over? It would hurt. Hey, hey, Danger. hey, don't Danger. do that. It's a warning signal, right? So let me clarify that. I keep saying it's a warning signal. Pain is not a reflection of the condition of the body, but it is a warning signal. You ever touch a hot stove by accident? I think everybody watching this at some point has bumped their arm against the side of the oven or touched the stove top. And immediately the brain goes, ouch. It's not a conscious thought. There's a sensation that you just touch something metal. And that nerve signal goes up to the brain stem, and the brain has to evaluate what's going on. And the brain goes, Holy crap, Zay just touched the metal. The stove's been on for 10 minutes. We better warn him. Ouch. You yank your hand away, and then you look, but you're not burnt. So, why did it hurt? It's just a warning. Warning signal. A warning signal. There's plenty of examples of people who have true injuries that don't hurt because they don't know they're injured. It's fascinating science. There's other cases where people think they're injured. So the classic story is a gentleman in 
London, UK, somewhere, construction worker jumps off of some scaffolding and he can't move his boot. He looks down and there's a nail going through his boot. Flips out. Yeah. Ah, ah, starts screaming in pain and, you know, they cut the board, load him into an ambulance, bring him to the hospital. The guy, morphine, couldn't even touch the pain level. <laughs> right. Get him to the emergency room. Oh, my God. You know, giving him more morphine. Nothing's helping. He's screaming in pain. They uh, they cut his boot off, and sure enough, it was between his toes. He was not punctured. He wasn't even bleeding. It had gone directly in between his toes, but this guy thought he had a, a construction nail going through his foot. What happened to the pain the minute he realized there was nothing wrong? Gone. So the perception of danger is what mattered. There's other people who have injuries. There's people who get bit by sharks. They feel a bump. They don't realize anything's going. They don't even feel the pain. When they realize I've been bitten by a shark, perception of danger, whoa, here comes the pain. Soldiers on the battlefield getting blown up, missing an arm, leg is in pieces. They're on the chopper flying back to base camp. The medic's saying, I'll get you some morphine. Soldier's going, I don't need it. I'm good. I don't hurt. You're missing an arm and your leg's in pieces. I don't hurt. Perception of danger. They're off the battlefield. They're going to the best surgeons in the world. And this is their ticket home. They're going to see their wife and kid. A good safe. deal. I'm safe. Yeah. I'm off the battlefield. Perception of danger is what determines whether pain is there or not and the significance. Last story, my ex-wife broke her ankle running through the woods, rolled it on a tree root. She almost fell, stumbled. She felt her ankle roll, and she heard perception of danger in the middle of the woods a mile from our car was holy shit i just broke something excuse my language um so every time she hobbled back to the car ouch 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 the moral of this story is once she got to the emergency room and they x-rayed and said yep clean break but this will heal up just fine in 10 weeks you'll be running again here's crutches use them for four weeks keep this boot stability boot you know the ones with the velcro yeah yeah the walking boots keep that on for seven weeks but 10 weeks you'll be running again the moral is that once she had that diagnosis was told it would be fine and she had the protective gear to keep her safe 90 percent of the pain was gone in two days how is that possible she still had a broken ankle because the broken ankle wasn't creating the pain the brain was the brain always creates pain so I'm not sure in your world what the diagnostic process is and what the medical prognosis is, but if you've been to six doctors and nobody's helped you yet, we come up with our own prognosis. I got no hope. This isn't going to work. Right. Danger, 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 danger. And now all of a sudden these symptoms really become very persistent. Yeah. So that's just a little bit about how the system called the human body and the brain works. Um, it's all about danger. So if danger is a problem, we got to teach the brain that we're okay. Simple. It's not a rocket science type of a concept. And when the brain feels safe, guess what happens? Symptoms come down. Yeah. I Somehow can... you found your way to safety, whether, whether it be, look, you, you asked about um, my fascial release and things like that. Um, fixing the body can cause some confusion in the brain. Because if you're working on the body, your brain might think we got a body problem, which may perpetuate things and delay recovery. But if you've got a great physical therapist who's, you know, table side manner is awesome and they do a wonderful job in saying, dude, we got this. This is going to be perfect. We're going to do this, this, and this over the course of the next two weeks and you're going to be golden. And that is very effective psychologically at dialing down the, the fear levels yeah is that a placebo not necessarily if you're truly not fearing it as much because you believe in your body's ability to get through this it's valid right because placebo can also be interpreted as fake it's not fake absolutely not yeah i fake. think yeah it's not fake so this stuff is all real it's science there's so many clinical studies on Placebo, nocebo. Nocebo is the belief that you're that something's wrong. Yeah. 
and all that's of these are well documented that's what a lot of those bad neighborhoods do you hear all these people telling their horror stories you start reading online and saying oh people with this get these symptoms that's a nocebo which is a belief that bad shit's going to come your way yep and you're going to be dealing with it for years and years before you figure it out exactly this so is not true i'm rambling a little bit here on the concepts but i think it's really important to understand that chronic symptoms are almost always a mistake by a brain perceiving danger your brain's working fine it's not messing with you it's just trying to keep you safe it's a warning signal but oftentimes it's a false alarm fueled by misinformation and fear we correct the information by understanding how the system works and the fact that you're actually okay and we dial down the fear guess what happens the brain turns off these symptoms yeah and i can attest to a lot of what you're saying even with um finding solutions with gut health and with posture yeah. because what i noticed is when i learn something new about my body or i learn something new about gut health and i start implementing it you feel safer exactly it's more like having a reason and understanding um mm -hmm. and a comfort of like all oh, like i'm not you know there is a way out i'm not stuck there is something that i can do and and that's sort of been my experience with it is that i do get a lot of benefit to it and there is that moment even before i've done anything i haven't done any postural anything i haven't started a detox none of that as soon as i like read about something that makes sense immediately i go like oh okay and hope i feel is, much better it's very powerful yeah here's a here's the cool thing it's not false hope because if the brain's stuck in a chronic pain loop it's basically fear pain fear pain fear pain or fear symptom fear symptom um finding hope does what brings down the fear exactly and that's why things can get better and it can happen a lot faster than people realize yeah absolutely and, and i've had some some pushback on this idea when i talk to people about you know learning how to relax and how to be present in the body and be be okay with whatever sensations and emotions are coming up and I would get angry commentators, you know? Uh, yeah, saying, I'm look, I'm sick. don't tell me to relax, you know? Give me some real science. There's real physical problems here. And there's almost like this idea that like emotions aren't real. <laughs> They're just like woo. -woo. Well, they're real, but they have no impact on us. You know, one, one thing I'll counter to that is, you know, we feel our emotions in our bodies. Yes. You cry, you literally shoot liquid out of your eyeballs, yeah. right? If you're embarrassed, what happens? Your face turns red in an instant. Exactly. If you're nervous, you got sweaty palms and butterflies in your stomach. So we're always feeling emotions in our bodies. So why not pain when we've got an overabundance of the fear emotion? Exactly. And so I, I, I'm not huge on the emotional world. I know that's where Dr. Sarno started with all of this. And there's a lot of people in this mind body space that are very into journal about your past, dig up your old traumas. Let's resolve those old traumas to get better. Personally, that didn't work for me. I spent six months journaling, never got anywhere with my symptoms, but I did get depressed because all I was doing is writing about all the bad stuff that's ever oh. happened to me and is currently happening to me. So yeah. that was never my solution. I don't recommend that to the people I work with just because, well, if it didn't work for me, why would I tell them to do it? And I don't believe that's necessary. Is there an emotional component? Sure. If your brain can perceive emotions as dangerous, well, then part of my you know, framework is teaching people that emotions are safe. How do we do it? Actually feel them. Yeah. Allow yourself to feel pissed off if you're pissed off or sad if you're sad or anger you know, whatever allow yourself to do that so your brain can go holy cow look at danny felt all these intense emotions nothing bad happened yeah. i don't have to i the subconscious brain don't have to protect dan from these emotions because he's been feeling them he's fine he's still he's alive fine. so yeah the emotions are a part of it but not all of it as many people in the mind body space will want you to believe i'm not all about the inner child i'm not all about the dig up the old traumas and relive them and reframe them and mm -mm. release them um i've had more people tell me that they got worse by doing that 
Why? Because they're bringing up old fears and old fears is perceived danger. And now all of a sudden their symptoms are getting worse and mentally and emotionally, they're in a much worse place because they're reliving all the bad stuff in their lives. I'm all yeah. about the now. I'm okay now. Look around. Is there anything bad happening? Nope, I'm good. And so to me, that's the important thing is safety now. Absolutely. This, this is also in line with um, the training I got in like somatic work and, you know, ev everything I've read about somatic experiencing and that is mm -hmm. don't go into the story. Don't, you know, go over bad memories in your head. Just pay attention to the sensations in the moment. It's like mm -hmm. everything you need to do is right here and now. Mm -hmm. And it's not in your head. Yeah. And if you pay attention to the sensations and you disconnect the fearful thinking about it and you're just being present, it's like, okay, so that's an unpleasant sensation. But when you understand what's causing it in the first place, just an overprotective brain sounding a warning signal that's based on misinformation and fear, it's a lot easier to dial down the fear. Absolutely. And not be so afraid of your experience because you recognize well, not actually broken. Now, there are assessments that can be done to figure out, do my sy symptoms make sense from a mind-body perspective? There's inconsistencies, fluctuations, sometimes on, sometimes off, structural problems, infections, diseases. They don't take a vacation when you go on a vacation, for example. Now, for the person who goes, yeah, I went on vacation, but I hurt the whole time. Yeah, well, you're probably fairly... Uh, afraid of the symptoms and afraid of it ruining your vacation the whole time. And trust me, I've had a number of vacations ruined. I had my wife and kid go out to dinner without me as I laid in a hotel bed and they had to bring me some food back because I couldn't get in the taxi. Yeah. You know, so, you know, for anybody who thinks I'm dismissing this whole experience, been there, done that, you know, spent 14, yeah. spent 14 hours on a hardwood floor because I couldn't move without waves of back spasms. So it's, it's been a journey, but uh, at least for me, you know, I can look back at it as a huge gift. And that's what you're doing right now. Your experience is a gift that you are now paying forward to other people by saying, hey, I know you're in trouble, but there's hope. There's hope. And I can point you in the right direction. I can help you. Um, so that's a beautiful thing. And most, yeah. of, the, most of the TMS coaches, doctors, therapists, or people who have experienced it firsthand. And I've noticed, so yeah. It's been so profound for them that they just want to give back. Yeah. Well, it was it was a complete shift in, in identity for me, too, because, I mean, like you mentioned, when, when you're in pain for a long time, it just, for, for that time, it becomes a part of who you are, and you start to identify with it, and you tell people about it. Mm -hmm. Hey, have you been? Oh, not so good. And that's the first <laughs> thing you talk about. And like you said, people start checking in on you and it's it's a way for you now to get attention and connection from other people. And it definitely gets interwoven and and breaking free from that from that fear and and that just state of like anxiety and, and pain is is very liberating. And yeah, it's like the first thing you want to do. You're like, well, I got to tell everybody about this. Like, sure. yeah. Yeah, but then you go into these communities that know nothing about it and they're like, what are you talking about? I got a real problem. Yeah, yeah. So you got to be cautious on how you uh, how you present it. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. It's still very sensitive. You know, people get very defensive, argumentative. And and yeah, uh, yeah. I stress something in the, in the community we're in where it's like if you're having a bad day, you know, people are here to listen and, and help you out. But also, you know, like always focus on the positive. And, yeah. and there's a good number of people in there that have recovered who are just there to sh share that experience and essentially mm -hmm. just remind people like, hey, there, there's a good chunk of us here that got past this. You're yeah. not alone. You're going to make it. Yeah, which is incredible because hope is very contagious, just as fear is. Yeah, for sure. So, so for the people who take offense at hearing what's really going on, um, it's probably because family, friends, doctors have said something stupid like, so it's in your head and why don't you just stop it? Like, exactly. Yeah. Or, you know, you're, you must be crazy then. 
what's wrong with you? I don't have that going on. You must be nuts if you got pain all over your body or wherever. Yeah. Um, so if they've been judged in some way from somebody else, your posts that say you can fix this with this, this, that, and that, they're just going, he's, he's judging me too. Yeah. So it's understandable. Um, but I don't really go into those communities and try to change their mind. People find me, people hear word of mouth. You're, yeah. You're spreading word of mouth. You've got a lot of views on your YouTube channel already. And people are saying, Oh, this dude helped me out. You should check him out. Absolutely. That's much more of an easy, gentle way. And I get very little hate on my YouTube channel. Very little. Almost no people are, you know, complaining or yelling at me, which is a wonderful thing because that takes its toll. <laughs> it definitely does. It definitely does. And I and I've watched a good number of your videos. You know, the fact that you've been through this and you went through it for years gives you a lot of authority and credibility. The way that you talk about it is is very gentle and understanding of you know everybody's experience and perspective, which just reinforces that like that sense of safety for people listening to you, mm -hmm. because I think every time somebody gets judged for what they're going through, now that's like more danger. It's like, oh my God, like now even Criticism. people aren't safe. Yeah. Criticism's perceived as a threat because if yeah. somebody's criticizing you, they're attacking you verbally. So that attacks are never safe. Yeah. So the problem is a lot of people end up criticizing themselves. Yep. I'm doing this wrong. I can't figure this out. Oh, I'm not getting any better. You know, yeah. and um, it's a challenge. You know, I make things very simple, but I won't ever say this is easy to do. Yeah, absolutely. People go, this is so hard. And I say, yeah, you know what else is hard? Staying in despair and having no hope for any future. That's really hard, too. So you can pick between that hard or this hard. This one's going to get you out of pain and symptoms. Let's do this hard. Yeah. And I can help you, and it does actually work. Or you can stay in the other hard, which is living with no hope and despair and suffering with symptoms all day. Yeah. I think so, it uh, becomes an easier decision when you frame it that way. And, and sometimes we need to frame it that way because people are people will argue with you, but this is so hard. Whenever I do this, that happens, and the pain is so bad. Okay, yeah. I get it. Been there. But the solution is still the solution. And so that's why one of my framework items is, you know, I, I call them the, the foundational four. Know what causes symptoms and pains, right? We've been talking about it. Number yeah. two, does it apply to me? And there are assessments that you can do to say, are my symptoms behaving like my brain's creating them? Or do I have a real physical problem? And there are assessments. So number three is, is there a cure? Mm -hmm. yeah, you've proven it. I've proven it. And probably millions around the globe have proven it. Absolutely. Um, and number four, which is the tricky one, do I have what it takes to implement this proven solution? Because a lot of people will say, but I'm too anxious or my pain's too significant or I've had pain for too long, so I can't do this. All four of those are necessary for you to really make progress moving forward. Because if all you're doing all day long is saying, I can't do this because I hurt too much, your subconscious is paying attention. Yep. And so we have to really get all four of those before we can move towards, you know, teaching the brain that we're actually okay. Got it. So what other questions do you have, man? This is your show. No, yeah, I'm I'm happy listening to you break all this down because you know I think uh, my people definitely need to hear it. Um, one thing that I noticed is important is having a positive community. You know, not necessarily the bad neighborhoods that you described that I've also seen on Reddit and Facebook and you know everywhere. What role does community play in helping? You know, especially men who a lot of the men I talk to, you know, I'm like, hey, do you have any friends? Not really. I used to have friends before I was in pain. Now I don't go out. I don't do this. I don't do that. So what role does this community and being able to share, not necessarily talking about the pain, but just having that sense of brotherhood and, you know, support from other men and women, what role does that play in I think helping the brain go into safety? I think it's huge because for so many people, 
there's a belief that I'm the only one. This has only happened to me. I don't know anybody who's going through this. And if you look at your immediate circle of friends, you may be the only one. Yeah. And family. And it's like, I'm uniquely broken. So to find out that there are, you know, communities of people with symptoms very much like the one you're experiencing, um, just the feeling of not being alone is huge. So if I have your permission, I'll just share a little bit of how I go about helping people. Please. Um, so I used to do one-on-one -on -one calls and I would do, you know, upwards of like 10 calls a week. Um, and that all started as a result of these daily YouTube videos that I've been doing for over four years now. Went from nobody knew who I was, couldn't find a client to my one-on-one -on -one coaching schedule. I had a three month waiting period just because people wanted to talk to me. Beautiful. It wasn't scalable. I was having the same exact conversation over and over and over again. And I just couldn't do more. I couldn't help more people. And I had to tell people, hey, I know you want some help, but uh, I'll talk to you in a few months. And they're going, but I need help now. So I decided to switch to a group coaching model. And so right now I've got a couple hundred people in a group coaching program. And we meet four times a week on Zoom. And it's not me training because all the trainings in a course that they get when they join. So it's like a two and a half hour course with all the, how it works. So a lot of the things we've covered and then here's the strategies for how we teach the brain we're safe. So the group is all about community, you know, and all on their own, they started calling themselves the pain free you family. I didn't make that name up. They did. They say, oh, I feel closer to these people than I do my own family because they get me. They understand me. So there's a huge sense of community. Um, last week, we just had our first baby born to somebody who was in the group, which was That's beautiful. Really super cool. So the family is growing. Uh, hopefully, this little one doesn't need any of our help yet. Hopefully not. <laughs> um, so the community is huge. So what we do is we get on there and we share victories, progress reports, mindset shifts, symptom shifts. You know, one lady went from 15 years of pain, three years of bed rest to join in the group. And she uh, shared in the Facebook community, which is just for the members. I drove a car for the first time in seven years. Wow. She's now bought a car. She bought a bicycle and this is a woman with pelvic pain. Now imagine you know, being a pelvic pain person, thinking about getting on a bicycle. Mm. Are you kidding me? You know, this lady's gone running, jogging. She had all sorts of food intolerances, was down to three foods, and she's now eating whatever she wants. She's always putting po pictures up in the Facebook community, having pizza, big ice cream dessert, drinking a glass of wine, and all sorts of whatever she wants. Um, and so that's what's possible. I had somebody else with all sorts of pelvic pain two years ago didn't want to be on this planet and i know you may have felt that way and i know many of people that you work with get to that state of despair like no hope i can't live like this don't want to i want to check out many God, times just take me just take me many times so this woman went from that position where she was literally thinking a month from now i'm going to look into assisted suicide in one of the countries in europe that actually it's legal to she just left the group and she's just like living large. She's always posting pictures about, I'm at this concert, I'm in the, this theater thing. I got on the train and I went to, you know, she went from uh, Scotland to London to meet up with another group member to hang out at Buckingham Palace. And like another member went from California to the East Coast of US to visit one person in New York City and another one in Boston. They're getting together to hang out because they're making like lifetime friends. Yeah. The community is huge if you can find people um that understand where you are and will cheer you on and support you no matter what you're going through it's invaluable so that's what you're doing with your community you're creating that sense of belonging and yeah. these people understand me because the people at home don't and i don't care how well you explain it they're just not gonna get it or understand it to the level that somebody who's also been in chronic pain or chronic symptoms will understand. 
So you can yeah. just look at each other and go, you get me. Yeah. I just know it. That's all it takes. You know, and that is so uplifting because you're not alone. You have a community to go through the journey with, and that's incredibly healing just by itself. Now with the effective knowledge and effective strategies to dial down the fear, create that safety, it's fairly predictable that people are going to get better. Yeah. It's not just possible. It's probable that they're going to get better. And the ones that very struggle, probable. Yeah. The ones that struggle the most are the, just the ones that are still running around like their hair's caught on fire. I, oh, I'm too afraid. Yeah. Let's breathe. No judgment. Cause I was there for a long time. Yeah. So it's really a matter of dialing down the fear with accurate information. What else can I tell you? So I do have to wrap it up, unfortunately. That's so so before we end, I feel like we've touched on, you know, the core. Yeah, the core of what it is that you do, the science of it, why it works so well, why other <laughs> things don't necessarily work, and you know, a little bit about how people can work with you. Um, how how can people find you? Somebody, you know, just finished watching this and they're like, oh my God, Dan's the man. I want to join his group coaching. Where do they go? Where they can, can they find you and start working with you? Okay, so two areas. Um, go to painfree, F-R-E-E-U, Y-O-U. So painfreeu.com and look at the get help menu. There's a getting started page, which gives you some intro videos the assessments, which I mentioned, which is, does this apply to me? And there's very specific characteristics of how symptoms behave if the brain's creating it versus a structural problem. That's a good place to start. And then I offer both free options for, um, you know, moving forward with your recovery. I have lots of people around the world getting better just watching my free daily videos, which is incredibly cool. Uh, but I also have a paid group. But under the get help menu at pain free you there's a link for the group coaching so you can go there and look at it uh Got you it. can join four times a week i have coaching calls and um it's a q a and it's sharing successes but the actual content of what to do is in the course which you also get as a member um if you want to find me on youtube you can just search for pain free you channel or I also have a shortcut, dansyoutube.com. Perfect. Auto forward you to my video page on the channel. Perfect. And we'll put all those links in the description. So Yeah, and I can email just... you some of that stuff as well. Yeah. I'm on Instagram uh, under Dan Buglio. So at Dan Buglio. Um, couldn't get the pain free you. Uh, you know, it was taken already. <laughs> so whatever. Maybe in the future. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. People got it. So I'm mostly active on Facebook and YouTube, a little bit on Instagram, um, but YouTube is where most of the views are coming. Got it. And um, I know somewhere when I was looking at your stuff, I saw there's a book that's either, is it out or is it on the way? Is that still happening? It is still happening. It's not, I've got no release date yet. Um, got it. I, w I was getting into some pretty good rough drafts when I launched the group, but I was so swamped with one-on-one -on -one calls and I was burning out that way. So I just said, all right, let me focus on the group. And so for two years, I've been really focusing on, you know, serving that community in a group coaching format. So the book still needs to be done. Um, but if you watch my daily videos, if you join the group and watch the course, you're going to get everything that's going to end up in that book anyway. Got it. So thank you for asking, though. No, absolutely. So uh, before we wrap up, more of a personal question for you is sure. how how do you feel with this community that you've built and the fact that you have people that have been in pain for years and that have contemplated suicide and now they're living their best life, essentially thanks to finding you and thanks to talking to you and being your program? Um, incredibly humbled because I didn't expect this. You know, it wasn't like I set out and said, all right, I'm going to start doing daily videos and, you know, help thousands of people around the world. And, you know, 
people are calling me a celebrity and i'm like what are you talking about i'm just i'm just, <laughs> I'm dan. just dan i'm just dan I'm, I'm like some dude who like records videos back by the woods behind the apartment that i rent which is above a garage on a property like i'm not some you know big deal but i just show up every day and help as many people as i can both for free and if you want extra help you can join the group it feels incredible to get the amount of praise and thank you and heartwarming dan you changed the trajectory of my life you know other people saying you literally saved my life it's like holy crap what do you do with that you know i had an ex-girlfriend who was like yeah you better watch it your head's not going to be able to fit through the door you're going to be so full of ego and, and you know that's one thing i kind of really intentionally do is just stay humble um it's very heartwarming and i'm sure you're feeling the same way as you start to help people and get that feedback that holy crap this dude really really helped me and so that's why we do it that's why we do it yeah i thought about stopping a few times and you know when things were rough for me my business wasn't doing too well i was super stressed out and then it's almost like there's like a perfect timing every time i'm going through it i'll get a call from somebody or somebody will send me an email and i talk to them and they're just like man your videos are the only thing that got me through this. They're like, please never stop. And I'm just like, it's it's been very far from an ego thing. It yeah, just like you said, either. it feels so humbling where I'm just like, really? Like that's how like that's how it made people feel. And then it's just this like responsibility and obligation to to keep doing it and keep helping people. That because there's plenty of times where this gets hard. You know, you have somebody message you in the morning going. I don't want to be on this planet. Please help. Yeah. It's six in the morning. <laughs> <Like, laughs> yeah. Today gonna be like, you know? And but just a feeling of I know my stuff will help them. This stuff works. And so obligation. Like and I've also been told I explain it better than many, if not most. Agreed. And so as a result, I have an obligation to continue to explain it better than others. Because if my simpler approach in explaining what's going on and how to get out of it is more helpful because it's less confusing and less weird, you got to go dig up your old emotions type of nebulous, how do I know if I found it, if I'm still hurting? I probably wouldn't. My approach is simple. It's like danger, safety, when the brain feels safe, symptoms come down. And so... Yeah, it's an obligation, but it's one that I step into with a lot of joy, a lot of reward. You know, it's like, it's like, yeah. Like we're doing it, Holy doing shit. God's work. We're helping, man. Exactly. Yeah. God's work yeah. is right. That's what it feels like. Well, Dan, and, thank you so and much. I've been told that as well. Dan, you're doing God's work. Yeah, this isn't YouTube even comments yet. that say, preach, brother, preach. <laughs> Come on settle down I like, folks. i'm just trying to help <laughs> yeah it's like all right <laughs> so yeah it, it is fun though and no, it's I great a lot of uh i made a lot of friends in my group community people that you know were like hey if i'm ever in the netherlands i'm coming to hang out with you <laughs> yeah right i'm just we're gonna hang out yeah got germany canada <laughs> india everywhere. everywhere everywhere i got people in australia new zealand Got a global family. People are time traveling to see me because my Wednesday night call has people in New Zealand Thursday morning. I'm like, they're time traveling to hang out with me. Isn't that cool? <laughs> it's very cool. So yeah. I know you said you got to run. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to talk with me. Um, I'm fun. super excited that we got to talk. And I'm wow. sure people are going to love this conversation and got so much out of it. Cool. And uh, I look forward to connecting with you again in the future, see how things are going with you and, you know, see how that book is coming along. So I appreciate, yeah, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to your community. And uh, like I said, share with me the video and I'll upload it and point people back to YouTube. Make sure when you share that with me, you kind of cover the, the areas of specialty that you tend to focus on if sure. there is one. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'll be sure to point that out. For sure. I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording. Take care, everybody. All right, guys. Till next time.
See you later. And, and.